Hey, we've been talking about uh, looking at that area of our life that we need to change. Uh, New Year's, and everyone starts thinking about New Year's resolutions. And without covering old ground, uh, 91% of them are going to fail within 3.2 months. 23% or 21% have failed within seven days. By now, probably statistically about 30 to 40% of you have stopped with your New Year's resolutions. Um, New Year's resolutions are about those areas that we want to change. But we've been looking at what's that area, getting God involved in the process, God, what's that area that I know I need to change? And if I don't change before I have to, consequence is going to catch up with me and I'll have to change because I have to. And so we've been looking at what's this area of your life where you know that I right now have the opportunity to change before I have to instead of waiting to change because I have to. Because we have stuff in our world that for a long, long time, maybe for some of us, we know this one area has the potential to cause the kind of consequence in my world that maybe I don't get a chance to bounce back from. Right? Maybe if I don't get a grip on this thing, it's going to cost me my marriage. And that would be painful. Uh, maybe if I don't get a grip on this thing, it's going to cost me in my business. It's going to cost me in my finance. Maybe if I don't get a grip on this thing, it's going to cost me relationship with my kids. Maybe if I don't get a grip on this thing, it's going to cost me any ministry opportunities. Maybe that the Lord wants to open up and to give to me because I just won't allow him to work in this area and I'll never be ready to take that next step. Whatever that thing is for you. A couple of weeks ago, we, we, we got everybody in this room that came to pray and ask God, what is that area? For you, what's that area where you need to change? No, I want to change, but where do I need to change? And uh, what we did is we got this little uh, toolbox here, and, and, and everybody that felt to come up came up and wrote on a piece of paper what that was. Nobody knows but you and God. They wrote it on that paper, they put it in an envelope. Envelope, I put in this box, I put this high tech padlock on it system. Um, and so nobody knows what's in there except for you and God. And during the week, this was uh, New Year's Eve, we, we preached this and we did this. And during the week, we've had people coming into the church and they're laying hands on that box and they're praying for you. They're praying for whatever that thing is, for breakthrough. Some of the stuff in that box has had a hold of your life for many, many, many years. And some of you have probably just gotten used to it and maybe you thought, look, it'll never change, I can't break through in that, whatever. Well, this year, we're, we're saying, what if we said in 2024 was the year where we said no more to whatever that thing is? Last week, we looked at motivations. What are some motivations that can keep us going? And we looked at three motivations. One is, is obedience to God. The Lord spoke to you. He said, do this. So as believers, if you're a follower of Jesus in this place, and I don't know everybody, and if you're not a follower of Jesus, hey, I'm glad you're here. It's great to have you with us this morning. If you are a follower of Jesus, then that must mean something to you. If God speaks to you and he's truly Lord, then you want to obey him. So God has spoken to you, so when it gets difficult and hard, keep pressing in because this is not a good idea. It's a God idea, amen? This is something the Lord spoke to you. The other motivations were the benefit for you. There's always going to be a benefit for you. Genesis 12, 1 and 2 is where we got these motivations from. And the third motivation is, hey, what are going to be the benefits and the blessings for the people around you if you can deal with this? Because change doesn't just impact us, does it? It impacts the people around us, the people we work with, the children we're raising, the person we're married to, the people we play sport with. Uh, it impacts us, our neighbours. They don't, all of a sudden don't hear us erupting in rage because we, you know, the, my favourite TV show ended for the year or... Stars lost the cricket or something, I don't know. Whatever it is for you, Rodney. Um, so that's what we've been looking at. So let me ask you uh, a question. Three friends are sitting having coffee together and one decides to leave. It's not a hard one. I, I was terrible at maths, but I reckon I can work this one out. Three people are having coffee and one decides to leave. How many are left? Right, okay. There's actually still three. Because just because you decide to do something doesn't mean you actually did anything about it. Right? Just because you decide to do something, that doesn't mean that you've practically and actually done anything about it. Right? So we talked about what is that area I need to change and we looked at motivation. This week for, and next week we're going to start to talk about, okay, so it's one thing to decide, it's one thing to put it in a box there, but now what are you practically going to do to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to see breakthrough, breakthrough and freedom come into your life? So we know what we need to change, we've got some motivation. So now we're going to look at what we've got to do. Um, when I was a young kid, my dad, uh, my dad was, he's a pretty burly sort of solid guy, you know, and, and you know, like every kid, you know, my dad's bigger than your dad syndrome. We all, when we were little kids, our dads were our heroes and so on. And, and I used to work on meat trucks with my dad when I was around 13, 14, 15. We were living in Mudgee and, and we would drive uh, over the Blue Mountains into Sydney and he would deliver the meat, the, the cows and everything in the back of the truck and, you know, he was, he was a... And we went to this one 
uh, shop one night, would have been about two o'clock in the morning, and we unloaded the meat, and there was a differential of a small truck that, that his boss in Mudgee had said to him, you have to bring, put that in the back of your truck and bring it home for me. Now, that's a heavy, heavy thing to lift by yourself. I was 14 or something at the time. I'm not helping him. I can't do that. But I remember watching my dad bust and twist and turn and everything, and he got that thing off the ground, and he got that thing in the back of the truck. He lifted that thing all by himself, and he threw it in the back of the truck. But his life was never the same after that. See, one man alone was not meant to carry that kind of weight. One man alone was not meant to lift something like that. He damaged some nerves and some discs and things in his back, and that altered and changed the entire course of the rest of his life to this day. He went from being a very active man, very physical man, to nowadays he's a bit of a recluse, a hermit, lives at home, doesn't much go out, constant pain in his back and his hips and so on had multiple operations and doctors look at things. He went from being a very productive person and working and he always had a job. My dad always found a job. He was always to, was, that job ended, he found a job. He was, he was very industrious like that. He was one of those guys that came from a generation where they could do everything, but they didn't have a piece of paper to prove it. You know, today it's all about the paper. It doesn't matter whether you can do it if you've got the paper. So he went from being a very, very active guy because he tried to lift something and carry something alone that he wasn't meant to carry. Now, there are things in this life that we're not meant to physically carry alone. There are also things we're not meant to emotionally carry alone or spiritually carry alone or mentally carry alone. There are some things that we'll never break free of or overcome on our own. We're not going to do it on our own. Just because you wrote it in a box, just because people are praying for unknown people for unknown reasons, doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to overcome it. We've got a part to play. What we need to do is bring somebody else into that space. I want to talk this morning about this little word that most people don't like, accountability. 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 It means being vulnerable and open with another person and inviting them in to carry that thing with you. Amen? Invite them into that space to carry that thing with you. It's interesting because when I began to think about this whole issue of accountability, it suddenly dawned on me that the, the Word of God, the Bible, this collection of ancient documents is absolutely chock-a-block with references directly to or indirectly to this whole issue of accountability. If you start reading through the Bible and put on a, a set of glasses that say accountable, it's amazing how you see this whole idea of accountability right throughout the Scripture. Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of, but encouraging one another. What are we encouraging one another? Encouraging them towards, spurring them on to love and good deeds. Encouraging them, don't forsake gathering together. What is that? It's kind of a picture of accountability, isn't it? It's a picture of keeping each other accountable. We're spurring one another on and we're encouraging one another. Hey, you, you, I notice you, you, you're not, you haven't come to... to and, and by the way, you're not saved by walking into a building. So please don't, don't anyone hear me say that if you don't come to church every week, you're going to hell and God doesn't love you. I don't, I'm not saying that. I don't come, I don't gather with a bunch of people where I was a pastor or not. I didn't gather at a church on a Sunday morning, put that time aside with a bunch of people to make God love me more. If you're doing it for that reason, you're eventually going to burn out because you can't do anything to get God to love you any more than he does right now. That's religion. Do this, do this, and God will love you more. We're not about religion, we're about relationship. Jesus reached, the story of Jesus is God reaching down to us because we could never reach high enough to get up to him. Amen? So God loves you whether you turn up or not. But I used to come because I know that there was benefit for me. It's great for me to gather with a bunch of people and, and get, be a part of that momentum to forget about everything else and to get my focus back on God. Sometimes by myself, I struggle to get my focus on God. Anybody like, like me? When I'm by myself and left to my own devices, my mind wanders, my heart can wander, my, my focus wanders. I can get to the end of a day and think, you know, I didn't really consciously kind of recognise the presence of God throughout most of what I went through today. Why, why was that? And one day drifts into two and drifts into three. And what we've got here, it's basically, what the, what's he saying? Keep one another a little bit accountable. Hey, I noticed you haven't been for the last two weeks. Hey, just want to encourage you, man. Don't, don't turn it into three and four and five. Don't, don't let it get easier and easier and easier, not to gather with other believers. It's a really good thing. Let's do it. There's, there's, a, there's a sense or a type of accountability here. I think, I think part of our spiritual growth, and this is something we don't do very well in the Western church, because we're so personal and private, and it's all 
me over here and you over there, and then we come together and Jesus has these strings that connect us, but, but the strings should be connecting us to one another and to Jesus. It's not just me and Jesus, you know? And I wonder whether the spiritual strength of the Western church is lacking because we actually don't embrace this kind of accountability. When was the last time somebody walked up to you and said, hey, how's your prayer life going? Do you have a prayer life? We all, we, if I said, who thinks having a prayer life is a great thing? I guarantee you, everyone that's walking with the Lord would put their hand up right now and say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then if we said, okay, so who has regular time? Who actually makes that a part of the discipline of their life? We might not get as many hands up. That's just a fact. Not having a go at anyone, it's just a fact. But what if you had somebody in your world that kept you accountable? Hey, what's your prayer life like? You know? But what if somebody was to ask you and keep you accountable and go, hey, what, what about your, your time in the Word? Do you, do you actually spend any time in the Word of God at all? Is the only time you ever eat the meat of the Word of God when you turn up on a church on Sunday and somebody is feeding you? Or do you feed yourself? Like, do you ever spend any time in the Word? Uh, um, imagine what your spiritual life like. Imagine what the vitality, the strength, the focus of the church in general could be if we grabbed a hold of the fact that, you know, as a body, there's a sense of accountability to one another. And we don't mind holding each other accountable for other things. But I wonder in, in the areas of spiritual growth, what would our life be like if we had people in our world that we invited into that space? They don't barge in. You never barge in. That's not accountability. But people we've invited into that space to say, hey, hey, I want to make myself vulnerable and open to you and I want you to ask me these questions because there's something powerful about accountability. Luke 12 verse 48 says this, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who's been entrusted with much, much more is going to be asked. It's almost like there's a sense of accountability for what you have. Again, I read that verse and I go, yeah, it's not just you have and that's the end. No, there's now this sense of accountability. Hey, if you've got much, much is going to be expected of you. If God's speaking to you and telling you to do something, it's not, here's what you should do, and then God just has not. No, there's now a sense of accountability with the word of God to you. Hey, God's spoken to you. What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? Matthew 18, verse 15, if your brother or sister sins, go and point it out to them. Go and point out their fault. Just between the two of you. They so listen, you've won them over. And then he goes even further. He says, if that don't work, take somebody else that's recognised that. And if they don't listen, he said, then, then take it to the whole church. I mean, that's a pretty serious sense of accountability. Imagine if we knew that's where it would land. Hey, if you don't get your stuff together and deal with this, we could end up standing up in front of church one day and going to everybody, hey, this person really needs... I've never seen that and I don't want to do that. And I'm not saying I'm going to do that. I'm just saying I'm reading that going, wow, that smacks of this thing called accountability, doesn't it? It smacks of accountability. But we don't like accountability, but it's really, really important. Matthew 12, 33 to 32. I've got 37, but it's not. It's 36 to 37. I tell you, everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word they've spoken. For by your words you'll be acquitted and by your words you'll be condemned. At some point, the Bible says we're going to give an account for the words that we speak. Matter of fact, at some point, we're going to give an account for the life we live. Accountability just seems to be all through the pages of the New Testament. Accountability seems to be something that's woven into this movement that we call the church. So let's go back to Galatians chapter 6, which is where we started three weeks ago. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. It says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, and we talked at the beginning, why wait to get caught? Don't wait to get caught in a sin. Change before you have to, not because you have to. So if anyone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. And in verse 2, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you'll actually fulfill the law of Christ. How do you fulfill the law of Christ? Well, Paul says one of the ways you fulfill the law of Christ You've got to be a person that carries one another's burdens. Now, that word burdens in the Greek, it literally means heaviness, weights, or troubles. The stuff in this box, I dare say, is a burden to you. That's why it's in there. You want freedom. You want deliverance. You want to be made whole in that area. You want to break out of this stuff. That's a burden. That's a burden. And Paul's writing to the Galatians going, people carry each other's burdens. But here's the question. How can someone carry your burden and therefore fulfill the law of Christ if you don't want to share your burden with anyone? How can someone carry that burden with you if you don't want to be vulnerable and say, hey, I've got this stuff going on? 
hey, I'm really struggling with this habit. Would you walk with me? I really appreciate your prayers, but I want you to keep me accountable too. I want you to I want you to, yeah, check in with me weekly. How are you traveling? Because I know my motivation is going to wane. I know it's going to be hard, some, but, but I really need someone with that power of accountability, someone to speak into that space and to spur me on and to keep me going. And don't let me lose focus. And when I'm saying I can't make it, I want someone that's going to go, no, you can. Because God spoke to you about that at the beginning of 2024. He said he wanted you to deal with that. And if he spoke that to you, there's power and there's grace there for that to happen. So come on, chin up. Let's keep walking. Let's keep going. I know we can get there. I know it's tough. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. But hey, I'm walking with you. I'm carrying that burden too. Come on, let's go. Let's keep going. Let's keep walking. The truth is, we can share our burden with someone because, before we have to, or we'll end up having to share our burden with someone because we have to. It'll take us down. It'll get in the way of our future. It'll destroy our marriage. It'll destroy our business. It'll ruin our bank account. It'll, it'll do whatever destructive thing, whatever the consequence of this thing not being dealt with could eventually catch it. It'll happen. And at that point, you'll probably have to share with someone because you have to. You'll have to then share with a counsellor about this or you'll have to give an account to, 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 to why this uh, uh, thing destroyed your, your, your business and you've got to sit down with your work employees or whatever or, you, or you've got to sit down and go, this is why this... How many people have been taken out of ministry again? And I wonder, I wonder about the people that you read about and see about that get taken out of ministry because they didn't change before they had to and they're forced to and they change because they have to. But, but what I wonder with some of them, was there anybody in your world that you chose? And by the way, accountability is a choice. Is there anyone in your world at any point that you opened your heart up to and you chose to be vulnerable in that area with? Maybe if you had somebody carrying that burden with you, maybe, maybe you might have wrestled that thing to the ground and, 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 and you, may, you may not have been uh, caught or, or, or faced with the consequence you were faced with and you may not have ended up where you ended up. Because we're called to carry one another's burdens. I know that it's not necessarily easy. And for many of us, it's not natural, especially in our culture, to share this kind of stuff with other people. There's a lot of comfort, isn't there? That day when I said, what's that need? And when I said to you, no one's going to know about it, and we're going to put it in the box. And by the way, no one's still going to know about it, unless you choose to tell them. No one's going to know about it. But there was a great deal of comfort, wasn't there? Knowing that no one's going to know about this, it's going to be on a bit of paper, no one's going to see the paper, you're going to write an envelope in a box, locked, people are going to pray for you, but they don't even know what they're praying for, but they're just praying for you. There's a great deal of comfort and freedom and liberty in that. But if I was to have said on the first day, we're going to wait on God and God's going to tell you somebody to go and speak to in the next five minutes about that, I wonder whether we would have had the same kind of response. Because it's just not natural or comfortable, is it? To sort of open up about those areas. Yet it's critical and imperative that we learn to walk vulnerably and accountable before one another if we genuinely want to become all we're meant to be and do all the things that God's called us to do. We can't do it on our own. We're not meant to. Right back at the beginning of creation, God says, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is good, this is good. Great man, this is very good. And all of a sudden you've got man in a perfect world, in a perfect environment, with no sin, no, nothing to watch on TV that's going to distract, nothing to read that's going to pollute his head. Perfect environment, perfect man with a perfect God, perfect union. He came down, walked in the garden, spoke with him. It doesn't get any better than that, but God says to Adam, this ain't good. It's not good, you need somebody else. And before we go, yeah, but that was purely for procreation purposes. No, I don't believe it's fully for procreation purposes. I think there was more to it than that. There was more to it than that. It was a part of it, but it's not the whole story. We don't want to put marriage up there as, the, as God's ideal and perfect for everybody. And if you're not married or you're single, there's something wrong with you, your spirituality. That, that's not at all true. I, I don't play those games. I don't like that stuff. It was a part of it, but not the whole thing. But what I do know is it's not good to be by yourself, even if you've got a perfect, perfect relationship with God you're still going to need other people in your life. And it's not easy. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's never been modelled to you. Maybe it's never been modelled to you to be honest and transparent and open. And I know a lot of people in this room, like myself, I never saw that growing up. As a matter of fact, I was told, if you've got stuff going on, you keep it to yourself. Because you know what's going to happen? People will weaponise it against you. It'll be used against you. Some people were afraid to open up because, oh, that, that'll be a reflection of what will they think of mum and dad. What will they think of, uh, of, of, of this person? Or what will they think of my, you know? And so we have all these reasons why we bottle things up, we keep them to ourselves. Maybe you've been burnt when you've tried. Maybe you have tried to be vulnerable and someone's, someone's burnt you with that information. 
Maybe someone's pulled back from you because suddenly they realise you're actually human. And their perfect image of you was shattered because what? You actually have a fault? You actually have a struggle? You're kidding. And here I was thinking you're perfect. Let me let you know now. Nobody in the room thinks anyone else in the room is perfect. Is that right? Okay. So it won't be a shock. Maybe someone's used your, wep- used your weakness as a weapon against you or maybe your transparency and honesty have cost you in some way, shape or form. You've been demoted, kicked off the team, told you weren't good enough. There's all these kinds of things that we face that cause us to not want to be emotionally vulnerable with somebody else and invite them into that space. Yet it's critical because we're supposed to carry one another's burdens. How can you do that if we won't share the real deep burdens? I mean, it's easy to share a burden of, oh, I'm really, really tired or, you know... Uh, you know, uh, there are surface level burdens and then there are these kinds of burdens. These kinds of things in your life that if you don't get a grip on it and change it, wrestle it to the ground, the consequences are going to slap you up the side of the head one day. And depending on what those consequences are, some consequences are very hard to come back from. They're very hard to come back from. So deal with them before we have to, not because we have to. So if we want the kind of life that we're called to live, then we need to get comfortable with sharing our struggles, our sins and our dysfunctions with other people. We need to embrace the power of accountability. We need to embrace it. Have you noticed on social media, it's like nobody on social media has a problem. You ever noticed that? Like nobody on Facebook has a problem. Every meal they eat, it's the best meal they've ever had. Every holiday they have, it's the best holiday they've ever had. Every, every picture of their husband, their wife, their kids, it's just all, man, I've got the best kids in the world. I've got the greatest husband in the world. I've got the greatest wife in the world. My business is the best. I just love my job. I just, we're so, we've got this culture where it's so comfortable sharing with a whole bunch of people we don't know all of the great stuff about our life that it feels so uncomfortable and abnormal now to share with maybe one or two people the struggles in our life. It feels abnormal because the world loves to paint this picture of everybody having it all together. Uh, we were at Burley Heads that time and there was that lady there and she's taken a, you know, a selfie uh, of herself and she had a boyfriend in a little tree there at Burley and it was so funny, we're walking past and kind of watching for about 20 minutes while she's, she's trying to get the, the selfie here and she's going over to him going, your leg's in the wrong spot, and so he, oh, okay, and then he go, and then she go back up and go, no, no, pull your head back more, oh, I want to, it's like, you're probably going to put something like chilling with my man, you know? As your caption, you're not chilling, you're stressing out, you're ripping into each other and you're just going to go happy days or something. It wasn't happy days, it was half an hour of your life and it was stressful. But everybody out there goes, oh, look at this couple, they're just so great, look at them, they've got it all together. You know, We've been doing marriage counselling with people, sitting down in our lounge room trying to keep their marriages together, talking to them while they're both putting on social media that day, oh, my husband's the greatest man in the world, he's, oh, I love my wife so much. No, you don't because you told us you don't even want to be together anymore. Just hours before, you're telling us you don't. And then you're posting all this and you turn up next week. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> no wonder everyone's shocked when somebody realises they're actually human. Oh, my goodness. They're not, per- Rodney's not perfect. <gasps> Peace and love is not perfect. What are you talking about? Life's not a highlights reel. So here's the thing. Let me be very clear. If you want to break free of whatever's in that box, you and God are not going to be enough. You and God are just simply not going to be enough. We've got to take it to that next step and that next level, right? Just because you decided to do something about it, by writing on a bit of paper and putting it in a box, doesn't necessarily mean you've done anything about it. That's a great first step, but now we've got to take it beyond that. If you've got to wrestle this thing to the ground, you should be thinking about, okay, who in my world? God, who is there that you've placed in my world that I can open myself up to and be vulnerable and accountable to on that journey towards freedom healing and wholeness. It's Romans 14, 12 tells us this. It says, so then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. You know, one day, whether you want to or not, there's someone that you are going to be accountable to. Think about it. At some point in life, whether you, whether you choose accountability now, there's going to be a point in your existence, death, when you stand before him where you'll have to give an account. And I was thinking about this the other day, going, you know, we've got babies being born and, 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 and when children are growing up, it's almost like each of us, we start our life being accountable, don't we? We're accountable. Mum and dad keep us accountable, you know? You stray a little bit, maybe depending on your generation, you know, a little bit of leather therapy perhaps or whatever it is. That, but, but discipline 
kind of comes into our world. And discipline is a type of accountability, isn't it? Kind of keeps us. And so we're born as children. We come into the world, and in the beginning of our life, we are held accountable by somebody else. At the end of our life, we are going to be forced to be held accountable by somebody else. And in the middle of it, we get the opportunity to choose to be accountable. We have the opportunity to choose accountability, to choose to open ourselves up to accountability from other people. Yet we spend a lot of our life between our birth and our death trying to fight against any type of accountability. That's why we have such an anti-establishment thing going on in this world right now. That's why we're so anti any type of authority. It's all because these things are there. God's put these things there as a type of accountability in different places. And we fight against it and we badmouth and we don't like it and there's a culture that hates all that and we want to throw the shackles off because we don't want to be accountable to anybody but ourselves. We just want to do our own thing. And I look at the world today and I say, how's that working out for you? Well, the church is here to model something different, aren't we? We, we have a chance to be a light on a hill to model something different than the way the world does stuff. But it's, it's amazing how easily the worldview and the mentality and the thinking of what's going on out there can creep into the life of the church. And maybe hear me even talking, even dare saying you should be accountable to people for spiritual growth or you should open yourself up to accountability. There are probably people here now going, I won't be back next week, you're pushing it too far, you're becoming a cult. I'm just telling you what the Word of God says. You don't have to do it. You, you don't have to do it. I'm just saying if you really want to wrestle this thing to the ground and you really want to grow... Then I'm, I'm saying when I look at the life of Jesus and when I look at the teachings of the New Testament, I can't help but think accountability is a really, really important part of my own personal spiritual growth and my ability to break free from the burdens and struggles and, and cares and worries of life. It's an important part of me growing into the person I'm meant to be. I'm not going to be able to do it alone. No matter how perfect and precious and beautiful my intimacy with him is, he still said you need other people. You need other people. We need one another. James, who was most likely the brother of Jesus that wrote the book of James, which is most likely the first uh, book actually written in the New Testament, he makes a connection between our personal vulnerability and our journey towards freedom, deliverance and wholeness. So many of us might believe in the myth of the self-made man and the self-made woman. I, I don't believe that exists. We need each other. But James makes this connection between your personal vulnerability and your healing. In James chapter 5, verse 16, and if you come to a rise... I've been throwing this verse out now for a couple of months because it's kind of becoming more and more imperative to me and important to me. I'm, I'm understanding it more and more, the connection between my vulnerability and my healing. In James 5, 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other. Hang on a second. You don't confess sins to each other. You confess sins to God, right? Right? Isn't that what we do? We're, we're taught you confess sins to God. James flips it a little bit. He goes, hang on, I want you to confess your sins to one another. He says, and pray for each other. Why? So that you may be healed. He doesn't say, so you may be forgiven, because he knows this. Now you confess your sins to God and you'll get healing. So for, uh, forgiveness, sorry. So if all you want is forgiveness, confess to God. Go ahead, you and God in your closet, keep bringing this stuff up. God, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm not... You can do that and you'll get forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a problem. You don't have to do anything to get forgiveness. God's purchased forgiveness for you on the cross. You are forgiven, right? But James is not talking about forgiveness. He says, when you bring it out in the open... And you get it out of that dark space in your heart, that dark place in your life. See, moss grows and mold grows in dark, damp places that are hidden from the light. He says when you open yourself up and you let a bit of light in there and you get vulnerable and you share that with somebody else, he says here's what happens. That begins a process in your life where you start moving towards healing. Because it's not just about forgiveness. We don't want to run around whatever's in there for the rest of our life saying, God, forgive me. Jackie, would you forgive me? Friends, would you forgive me? God, would you forgive? I don't want to run around my whole life going, God, keep forgiving me. And God's going, yeah, I'll forgive you. It's not a problem about forgiveness. But God's going, I don't want to just forgive you. I want to heal you. Because I don't want you to have to keep coming back to me. Because I know the guilt and the shame and the stuff you carry inside of you because you know, you, 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 you're not breaking free of this. And you keep going back to old habit patterns and what's comfortable in default settings. God's saying, I, I, I've forgiven you. That's not an issue. But what I want to do is heal you. I want to heal you. Because God loves you and he loves me. And he wants to see us whole. He wants us whole. And by the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God, we can be free of these things. We can break free of these things. But I think God requires that we work together with not just him, but we work with one another. There's power in getting that stuff out. 
And when the devil comes and goes, nobody knows, you go, no, no, hang on a second. You can't, you can't say that to me. I've got this person knows that person. I brought that out in the light. I'm doing the work. I'm doing the stuff, devil. Back up. I brought it out. He says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Now, it's interesting. The word that he uses for sins there, the usual word for sins is uh, the, the, the Greek word hamatia. And it literally means missing the mark. And we talk about that a lot here. Firing an arrow like an archer's turn, bang, target's there and it falls short. The word James used for sins is not that word. He uses a different word. The word that he uses is parapetoma, and it literally means to fall beside something. It means to fall beside something. A lapse or a deviation from truth and uprightness. It's not falling short. He's talking about not just sins as in falling short. He's talking about things that you're not falling short, you get in the distance, but it's just deviating and landing off to the side. These things are pulling you off to the side. You're missing it, not because you're falling short. You're aiming in the right direction, but it's just deviating and falling off to the side. That's the word that he uses here. Stuff that's falling off to the side. See, confession to God positions us for forgiveness, but confession to others is what positions us for healing. And I'll go a step further and say it positions us for deliverance, for freedom, and for wholeness. That's why people love group fitness classes. It's the accountability. I'm not going to run around a circle by myself. When I know I've got football training and I know the other 12 blokes are going to be there, I won't miss a training session. But you want me to run around doing laps by myself? I've got no motivation for that. I can't do it. But I know those other guys are going to turn up and they're going to expect me to be there. So I'll turn up. That's why people with addictions, that's why it's really great to go to recovery groups. Gamblers Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous and so on. Why? Because it's a sense of accountability. Nothing magical is happening in the group other than I know every seven days I'm going to walk into a building with a bunch of guys that are struggling with that too and I'm going to have to confess my sins, confess my week, talk to them about how my week's been and because of that, that gives me a little more motivation to go, no, no, I'm just going to, I'm going to keep walking in the right direction because I know that power of accountability. I don't want to stand before those people and say, ah, blew it again, ah, blew it again, ah, blew it again. Because you know what they're going to do? They're not going to go, oh, that's okay, you're only human. They're going to go, no, you know this thing's destroying your life. You know, you, you know that you, you're here because you know you need to break free of that. So come on, get back on the, on the wagon with us. Come on, keep marching ahead. Come on, keep going. That's what they're going to do. That's why these groups are so, so important. If all you want is forgiveness, just go to God. But if you want healing, then you've got to be vulnerable and invite others into the journey. I was speaking at a, 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 minute, a YWAM school a few uh, months ago in Brisbane. And we had about... 40 international students in the room. And I was talking to them out of this verse about, you know, God forgives you, but we want healing. We've got to get vulnerable. And I was talking to them about a particular area that a lot of young people struggle with these days, with images and pictures and, and all that sort of stuff that they see and easily fall into. And at the end of it, I said, look, here's the deal. I'm just going to pray for you and, you know, Lord, if you want to just have some time with God and just, you know, confess, speak, whatever. And about a minute into my prayer, I, I felt this presence next to me out in my eyes, and here's this young guy from Germany. His parents were in, uh, a high involved in ministry in Germany and no one in a lot, of, a lot of spaces. He got up and he said, I just need to say something. And, and, and keep in mind, they'd been on this school, this, this intimate course together for about six weeks at this point. And he got up and he said, oh, I've just realised something. He said, I've got this problem. And he confessed the problem to this room full of people. It was a beautiful moment, beautiful moment. He said, I struggle with this. He said, I want to get it out. He said, because I've realised I fall, I go to my prayer closet, I pray God forgives me. I go back out, I do okay for a couple of days, I fall again, I go to my prayer closet, I pray God forgives me. I fall, I pray. He said, I've just realised this morning that my problem is not forgiveness, it's healing. And I go to my prayer closet and pray and I've got forgiveness, but what I really need is healing. Yeah. So he said, I'm, I'm going to open myself up to you because yeah. I want healing. And it was amazing. Something broke in the room. I'm not going to ask you to do it, by the way. Something broke in the room. Another kid got up. And then a couple of girls got up. And so on. before you know it, there's about 20-something people that are all getting up and they're just opening up about these things that have been living in the dark, deep places of their life, controlling them, causing them great shame, great guilt, uh, causing them to act certain ways, behave certain ways, and so on, and really uh, dimming that light of, of Christ in their life, their ability to walk freely into everything God had for them. And one by one, they started getting up and just speaking out. And the group just got up and gathered around them, embraced them, prayed for them, eyeballed them, said, we still love you. Matter of fact, we're so much more impressed with you now that you had the humility to do what you just did, to get up and to do that. 
James 4, 6 says God opposes the proud, doesn't he? He says he opposes the proud. I don't want to, tell, I don't want to be vulnerable. I don't want to tell anybody what my struggle is because... Uh, well, it's a frightening thing when you think about that, God actually opposing the proud. It's not that God sits there passively and lets the proud do whatever they want and let the chips fall where they will. He says, no, I oppose the proud. But it says he gives grace to the humble. Grace to the humble. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul talks about the grace of God and the power of that in his life. He says, I'm the least of the apostles. He says, I do not even deserve to be called an apostle. And maybe there are things in that box where you go, I don't even deserve to be called a Christian because there's some of that stuff in there. And if I tell people about that, if I open myself up to somebody, what's that going to mean? So you keep it bottled up. Paul says, I don't even deserve to be called an apostle. Because I persecuted the church of God. What he literally means is I dragged Christians off, threw them in prison. I know that there were people that were killed as a result of my decisions. That's a heavy, heavy thing to carry. But he says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. For the grace of God is not just unmerited favour. The grace of God is the power of God in your life to change and transform you. And when we humble ourselves, it says that God's grace comes into those spaces of humility. And that grace is the power of God to assist in the transformation and the change that deep down inside you want. That's why you wrote it in there, right? That's why you put it in there. Because you want change. God spoke to you and said, hey, I can see up ahead. I've got the beauty of, of, of foresight. And if you don't get a grip on some of that, you could end up crashing up here somewhere. So because I care for you, I'm telling you now, hey, deal with some of this stuff in your life now we're not expected to expose ourselves to everybody like the young fellow in YWAM did but can I encourage you find somebody in your world that you can open up to and go hey I want to I want to now I've decided to do now I'm going to actually do something I want to share with somebody it might be might, if you're in a connect group it might be there might be one person it could be two three people Maybe those people aren't even in this room. I don't care where they are. I've got people that I'm accountable to uh, for, for parts of my life that I choose to be accountable to. I've got people in this town here. I've got people in different countries. I've got people in different states. But I've got people that I... And they've got permission. You can ring me at any time, at any moment, ask me point blank about that area of my life and I'll be brutally honest with you. Now, I know them phone calls could come any day, any time. It's amazing, that power of accountability. That it, it just adds that extra little bit of strength to you to keep walking the walk and doing what you've got to do. I was talking to somebody recently and they told me that, well, I just don't have anybody in my world that I could possibly talk to about that. My response to them was this. I actually don't believe you because God loves you and he wants you delivered and healed and set free. And my Father in heaven would not put you in a space or a place in life where you actually have nobody you could talk to. How cruel would God be? There's somebody. Maybe for some of you, you've got to get over past hurts. Maybe for some of us, we've got to put down the walls and actually step back into that space of trust again and vulnerability. And I'm not saying it's easy. What I'm saying, though, is that it's really, really important. It's really, really important that you find somebody in your world. Jesus had 70, 72 people talk about, sent them out on missions trips and then he had this other group, didn't he, called the 12 that he did a bit deeper life with and shared a bit more with. He gave a parable out here but he gave an explanation in here. And then from the 12 he had a smaller group, didn't he? Peter, James and John. He took them when he was transfigured. He took them in to see Jairus' uh, daughter get healed. He took them to places that the other nine didn't necessarily go. He opened himself up a little deeper to those guys, didn't he? When he was going to the Garden of Gethsemane, he took the 12 and he dropped them off and he said, Peter, James and John, you guys come further with me. And he opened up to them and he said this, my soul is, is so tormented to the point of death. Jesus felt the need to get that out and to share it with somebody. I am no better than my Lord. Jesus had people that he shared with. And then maybe Jesus had that one a little bit deeper too sitting around the table. One of you will betray me and they leant over. Said, who is it? Who is it? One of them said, ask John. He'll tell him. So I'm not saying that you just open up your stuff to everybody. Right? Don't walk out of here and start telling everybody everything about your life. I'm not saying that. That would be unwise. 
What I am saying now is we need to ask God, who's that person or people that I can take the next step with this and go, right, yeah, God, here's what I've got in there. I'm trusting this with you. And if somebody opens himself up and is vulnerable with you and, and trusts you to that degree, don't you dare betray that trust. Don't you betray that trust. Okay? You do the right thing. But there's people in your world. So let's bow our heads. I just want to pray for 60 seconds and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Those of you that have stuff in this box, I'm going to pray, Holy Spirit, give you a name, a person or people, somebody you can be vulnerable with, someone you can choose vulnerability with, open yourself up, expose yourself to, and start that journey of accountability with that person. So I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that each person in this room, God, whatever that, that area is that you spoke where we need to change, or God, maybe people are here today and they haven't been here for the last couple of weeks, but maybe as they're hearing me talk, they're thinking of that one area in their life that they know they need to change. If I don't change before I have to, I will be changing because I have to. If I don't change right now and make the choice to change, then consequence is going to catch up with me and I'll probably be forced to have to change. So why not change before you have to instead of waiting to change because you have to? So Lord, if, 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 if people are here this morning and they're, they're thinking that and they know what that thing is, Lord, I pray, Lord, would you take us to that next step? Who in their world, who in their world, God, can they open up to, be vulnerable with, and say, hey, I want to share something with you. I want to open myself up to you. I want, I, I want to begin to walk in accountability with you in this area of my life. And I want, I'm going to be honest with you. You're going to be honest with me. And I'm going to let you help me carry that burden because I know I can't carry it by myself. Father, who is that person? I pray right now, Holy Spirit, would you just drop some names into people's hearts in this place? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, can I encourage you, if you felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to you and there's a name of somebody, write it down. Go and write it down somewhere. Because by the time you get out of this room, back into your car, you're going to water down whatever it is that God's saying to you. The birds of the air are going to come and pluck it out and so on. All that stuff happens, life happens. And before you know it, you're going, no, it wasn't really God. Maybe it was just the pizza I had last night or whatever. My heart, tummy was rumbling. I was waiting for Tim Tam after church and he wouldn't stop talking. Whatever. All right? Write it down. Write it down. If you've got a phone or something, write it down. Write it down. So, Father, I want to thank you for your word, God. And I want to thank you for, uh, uh, God, this opportunity that we have at the start of this year. Lord, not to just make New Year's resolutions and, you know, let the chips fall where they are. God, we are, we are taking a little bit of uh, control, I guess, of our destiny. And, God, we've invited you into this space and you've spoken to people. And Lord, we know where we need to change. And God, we're, we're, we're doing what we can to remain motivated to change. Now I, I just thank you for this next step, Lord, this next uh, uh, opportunity, God, to bring somebody in, Father, and to carry that burden together, God. Lord, you said you oppose the proud, but you said you give incredible grace to the humble, Father. And as we humble ourselves to others, Lord, I know grace will come on in. So Father, I just pray a blessing upon each person here this morning, Lord, as we leave this place, God, I pray for a great week this week. Father, I pray also that you would give us the opportunity to bump into people. God, there are people in our community that do not know Jesus. They do not know the love of God. Father, there are people out there with all kinds of weird and wonderful ideas of what a Christian is, what the church is, who Jesus is, what, what God is as a father, images of a father, all that stuff. And I pray this week, each person in this room that actually knows you, God, that loves you, would you give us a chance to tell somebody out there this week something about the goodness of God, the love of God, the reality of Jesus, the death, the burial, the resurrection. God, would you give us those divine opportunities this week to, to glorify God and to share the good news with other people. We ask for those opportunities in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys. We got.